until the Second World War, I think, that, or even afterwards, there was a traditional agriculture was very closed loop. I mean, um, there were communities up in Brinscombe Moor where there was 40 different farms above, you know, Burnley, which were completely self-sufficient. Yeah. I think the the idea of the stuff being bought in off the farm, um, agrochemicals, fertilisers, and then everything carted off the farm, it becoming more linear, more of a production model, mm. like a factory model. That's kind of crept in over time, and now that's the um, standard way of farming. So what is he doing? Uh, he's just farrowing the lands because it's coming up to the season now where you start planting your grass because the field's not been great. So it's just tilling the land so you can start growing crops and start getting more grass for the animals. So what does he do? Just tear up the land, basically? So it's generally just... So you open up the land, so you, you literally just graze near the top of it so you, so you produce some loose, loose soil. So what you do is then you're able to sow your seeds in afterwards and then you, it's going to grow. <laughs> As you see it, what are the problems with agriculture at the minute? And the major problem that it's destroying the life support systems of the planet in particular around uh, destroying soils. The soil gets destroyed by, um, firstly by cultivation, which has been going on for between 6,000 and 10,000 years. Um, and sort of all, all part of the permaculture approach is to do as little uh, disturbance to the soil as possible. All in all, probably, over a few years you probably will damage the soil so what you do is you you till the land for four years and then for the fifth year you let it rest so you actually let it rest for a year does that actually do anything do you like put muck in it and stuff or well you generally just just leave the field for a year so because if you can probably notice there's quite a lot of mud and so you, you're generally ruining the land so as you can see there where, where the buckets are yeah yeah down, that's where the animals congregate so to let that recover really, you leave it for a year and it just, it just leaves your fields looking nicer and then you, the year after that your season of hot crops is going to be much better. The upside of that system is that the, a single farmer, can, in calorific terms, can feed in the US 200 people. It's the highest ratio at any point in history that in the past we needed. I don't know, upwards 50, 60, 70% of the population just working to create food to feed the whole population. You know, the, the whole soil, biology, chemistry, environment, the, the, it's a whole ecosystem, but the conditions are changing rapidly underground. As oxygen gets used up, as moisture fills the pores up, hmm. soil structure is very important. And so the, the, the kind of both cultivation and the application of fertilizers is destroying soil structures. Um, and another thing that can happen if you're not careful is that if you overstock your livestock, the soil gets compacted, yeah. which is, again is, is damaged. Um, well, going back to plough agriculture, if, if you do that and the wind comes up, the soil, your soil structure begins to disappear, so when the wind comes up, then the soil blows away. Mm. This is one of the precursors of desertification. There are purist models on either side, there are extremes on either side. I suppose when mm. you think of extreme conventional agriculture that's completely unsustainable, you might look at the Midwest of America with the massive combine harvesters you know, that, that are being driven almost like robotically across vast plains which are built on aquifers which are not being replenished. So you might look at the extremes of um, Monsanto crops, mm -hmm. fertilisers, and then you might go, OK, well, you've got a, you know, an Austrian off a hillside who's... Um, almost doing everything by hand and both those are really really um, they are the extremes I think there's a, there's a place that clusters around the achievable yeah. which is a mix and there's nothing essentially wrong with using uh, mechanisation there's nothing essentially wrong with resisting mechanisation it's just it's appropriate to the land you've got and the, the use you want from it and the also the community and the values you want to create. Are we dependent on oil? Totally. Uh, I, I quite like some of this work that's been done recently that's compared our um, attitude towards fossil fuels to some kind of addiction. <laughs> and because 
we are realising that, that there are ways that we can well, minimise our use of the equipment. Actually, quite a pressure for us. Post war onwards, then, we just had a massive increase in the amount of oil available, and that meant that mechanisation was a lot more possible. Yeah. And also, the cost of agrochemicals went down, cost of fertilisers went down, too, and they, they were pushed. You know, they were aggressively pushed by um, the government agricultural policy. Really? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, during the Second World War, there, up until then, I like said that there'd be the, the traditional farm might have a mixture, especially in the north of England, had a mixture of um, animals and some um, arable crops, some some roots, some just a, a really good mix of um, of food. And the waste from the animals would go into the field, which would be used to grow the crops, and even saying chat moss out out towards Salford and all the mosses around Manchester, the, the, the night soil, the waste was dumped on the fields and then that grow yeah. and the food would be transported back into the city. So it was fairly what you call a um, you know, circular model. Yeah. Uh, that got broken by um, the idea of just being able to spray fertility onto the fields, grow crops and um, that's the main difference between permaculture and agriculture. <laughs> My main concern is the way that people have been desensitised to and, di and, and divorced from um, not just growing food but preparing food is the big challenge now because a lot of people don't know how to cook so it's no use having given them fresh food they don't know what to do with it. It's the way mechanisation and subsidies have skewed the food market because mm. you end up growing things which can be grown and harvested easily mm. and on the whole that's cereal crops which in nature are extremely rare and difficult to harvest and difficult to process but hey they keep in the granary so you know historically going back five ten thousand years they're just the, they're the crop of choice aren't they? Permaculture is the practice of sustainable agriculture, focusing on design mimicking nature, biodiverse ecology and low energy solutions. Could you summarise what permaculture is? Yes, it's about helping people make a better future for themselves. And with permaculture design we're actually inhabiting the edge in between theory and practice. But the, the approach is really on the permaculture system to build soil, and that's almost impossible to do if we're turning it over. If you consider permaculture as the farthest point of sustainable agriculture and food, it, it can be incredibly productive. Mm. Uh, you can get uh, layer crops and um, you, you know, have a 3D use of space as opposed to just flat fields. Um, the crops you grow can uh, be s um, highly nutritious. Um, so, and you can also grow a different type of. You'd have to. You can move away from, if you like, fast growth. You know, yearly crops which are high weight, and sappy, if you like, towards ones which are slow maturing and have much higher nutritional value, much higher, denser um, sources of calories, which I think the people are moving towards. But. The problem, the perception of permaculture is it is, um, I suppose, utopian, idealistic and um, otherworldly, whereas um, it's actually an eminently sensible way of managing land. Yeah. And in terms of the volume of fruit and what it could sell at that for, I estimated it made about, could make up to £20,000 a year uh, per acre. Per acre. Yeah, because it's wow. growing a high-value crop, and and that's really low maintenance as well. They said that you do one or two hours a day wow. uh, during the summer. So it and there's Martin Crawford and there's many other people saying that this is the most productive way of farming and growing. Mm. However, it's also the most labour-intensive. <laughs> Relatively low maintenance, but more important for me that the, the maintenance such as it is, is quality activity. It's not back-breaking work, which is what you get stuck with in agriculture. Yeah, three, three benefits of permaculture are um, increased nutritional value of the food, 
um, a, co a community or a, a more group style of working which builds community mm. and um, potentially it has a, it's a way of increasing the fertility of the land rather than debasing it so it passes on through you know, the, the land to future generations. And I'm reminded of that thing that, um, that Gianna Macy captured about this sort of story about the Shambhala prophecy that at the, uh, at the time of great need the Shambhala warriors will emerge. Um, but we don't know who they are because they wear no uniforms. Thank you.